Welcome to the Servants of Grace podcast hosted by Dave Jenkins. Our podcast exists to provide trustworthy expository messages through the Bible and faithful answers to your theology questions. Now for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. Greetings and blessings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today we continue our study through the book of Revelation This is study number eight through this series, and it's titled From Death to Life. Would you please join me now in prayer? Father, we thank you that you are the head of the church and that you provide hope for us through the person and the saving work of the Lord Jesus. So Lord, we we thank you that in the midst of whatever challenges we are facing today, we can fear not because you are the great I am God. And so we trust you, Lord, and we love you. We pray, Lord, for this time of study that you've given to us as we consider this great text to wrap up this great opening chapter to our study in the book of Revelation. So, Lord, we, we just love you so much. Pray, Lord, that you are honored, that you would use this message to strengthen our faith, to embolden us in our mission to make much of you and to make disciples of Jesus who make disciples of Jesus. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to Revelation 1, 17 through 20. Revelation 1, 17 through 20. Hear what God's word has to say to us. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, for I am the first and the last, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Why, therefore, the things you have seen... Those that are and those that are to take place after this. And as for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars that are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands that are the seven churches. One of the most hotly contested issues in the book of Revelation is whether it describes events present in John's time or distant future events before the return of Christ. To this to this end, Revelation 119 is a key verse in this debate, which says, Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are, and those that are to take place after this. In the mind of many 20th and 21st century commentators, especially those influenced by dispensational theology, this verse outlines three sections in the book. Chapter 1 records the vision that John saw. Chapters 2 and 3 pertain to the present, uh, though uh, the letters to the churches, And then starting in chapter 4, Revelation describes events yet in the distant future. Well, the chief problem with this approach is that it fails to note how these three descriptions pertain to the material throughout the book. All of Revelation involves visions shown to John concerning things both present and yet to come. The best way to understand Revelation is to see it as a series of visions as they pertain to the entire church age and as they advance in focus to the events involved in Christ's return. Overemphasis on its future orientation has diminished Revelation's influence among Christians. If the book is focused on events not likely to occur during my lifetime, why should I even give it much attention? Why should we even teach through it? However interesting its visions may be. And yet, contrary to this view, Revelation should be given, if anything, a place of precedence when it comes to the present relevance of New Testament books. Our study of the opening vision in chapter 1 has highlighted this focus. You see, the exalted Christ in John's vision is currently Lord over the church and over all of history. Appearing to John as prophet and king, and especially as priest, Christ appears in this way. Uh, his, his disciples always know and always experience his saving work. Moreover, by, by standing him in the lampstands, Christ emphasized his present rule over and care for the churches that proclaim his name. Finally, John's reaction to the vision, falling at his feet as a dead, Revelation 1, 17, it shows how sinners must always respond to the divine holiness of God. Jesus' answer, fear not, introduces how the gospel always works in raising sinners to new and eternal life by the grace of God in Christ alone. And so the opening vision of Revelation, it vividly uh, uh, vividly portrays and presents the main actors of history. First, Christ is seen as the sovereign son of man who reigns in and triumphs over all. 
Second, the church is depicted in its precious value as a golden lampstand that shines the light of Christ. Third, John himself represents the people who are saved by Christ. And as we focus on him, it is startling to realize that when he saw Christ's glory, John fell at his feet as though dead, Revelation 1.17 says. Well, readers who are not well versed in scripture may find it strange that John, that the, John the Apostle fell apart in the presence of Jesus. In fact, John depicts here how sinners always should respond to a true vision of the holiness of Christ, whether in person or in the pages of scripture itself. And given the way that Revelation follows the visions of Daniel, we need to explain that the ancient prophet has a similar experience. Daniel chapter 10 records a vision almost identical to that of Revelation 1, causing Daniel to lose all his strength and collapse to the ground, Daniel 10 verse 9 says. This experience of being undone before the majesty of God was vividly described as well by the prophet Isaiah. On the night that he was commissioned as a prophet, Isaiah went into the temple and he saw the Lord sitting on his throne high and lifted up, Isaiah 6, 1 says. As a worshiping seraphim cried in Isaiah 6, 3, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, Isaiah responds, woe is me, for I am lost. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, Isaiah 6, 5 says. You see, the Bible indicates two reasons why men are slain in the presence of God's holy glory. The first is the awe of creatures and the presence of the divine. Job 42, 5 through 6 says, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. This overwhelming experience of seeing the Lord in glory is striking in the case of John, since he, he was the disciple most loved by Jesus and, and most intimate in friendship with the Lord, who has now revealed himself in divine splendor. The John of Revelation is not a new Christian. He is a mature disciple. He's long schooled in godliness and commended for his faithfulness under persecution. That John should fall as dead before the glorified Christ amplifies the significance of the Lord's majesty and radiance. Charles Spurgeon says this, The most spiritual and sanctified minds, when they fully perceive the majesty and the holiness of God, are so greatly conscious of the great disproportion between themselves and the Lord that they are humbled and filled with holy awe, and even with dread and alarm. A famous episode from the life of Martin Luther provides an example of this terror of the holy. After years of training as a monk, Luther was authorized to celebrate his first Mass as a Roman Catholic priest. He stepped to the altar and prepared to speak the Latin words that would supposedly turn the elements into the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. At that moment, however, Luther froze, and years later he explained, I was utterly stupefied and terror-stricken. I thought to myself, with, with what tongue shall I address such majesty, seeing that all men ought to tremble in the presence of even an earthly prince? Who am I that I shall lift up mine eyes, or raise my hands to the divine majesty? The angels surround him at his gnaw, the earth trembles. And shall I, a miserable little pygmy, say, I want this, I ask for that. For I am dust and ashes and full of sin, and I am speaking to the living, the eternal, and the true God. Psychologists in our time have looked on episodes like this and raised the question of Luther's sanity. Yet they fail to account not only for the creature's dread before the creator's glory, but even more for the sinner's terror in the presence of the pure holiness of the Lord. And this is the second reason why John fell as dead before the Lord, because he was a sinner in the presence of a perfectly divine, holy God. And from the biblical perspective, when we consider how grievous is a, is a single sin in the presence of God, we understand how appropriate it was for Luther to tremble in the presence of God. With this in mind, R.C. Sproul comments that if Luther was in, really insane, our prayer is that God would send to earth an epidemic of such insanity. Such sinners who experience the death of seeing their sins before God are the only ones forgiven through faith in Christ alone. So how much better is it that this shock terror over sin were to descend on the entire human race? When we consider biblical examples of Christians falling as dead before the Lord, a common element is their awareness of personal sinfulness. You see, Isaiah was undone. He, he confessed, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, Isaiah 6, 5 says. Job condemned himself when he saw God uh, after chapters of complaining about the Lord. 
Perhaps the clearest example was the, of that was the Apostle Peter when he first perceived the deity of Jesus. Peter had been fishing when he asked Jesus to proclaim, uh, to preach from his boat because of the large crowd. Afterward, Jesus told Peter where to place his nets, and when Peter obeyed, they, they were filled with fish to the point of breaking. Through these events, Peter perceived the divine majesty of Christ. Like John on Patmos, he fell down on his, on, at Jesus' knees, and then he pleaded, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord, Luke 5, 7-8 says. You see, perceiving the holiness of God, Peter was overthrown by a terrifying comprehension over his sin. Steve Wilmers writes, if, if we had a brief glimpse of the glory and the purity of God revealed in the, like this in Christ, we too would collapse and tear. Because in that moment, like John, we would become deeply aware, horribly aware of our own sin and his purity, his majesty, his greatness. I would see what I am like. I would see what God is like. And I would react just like John. How different is this perspective on God from the easy breezy attitude that permeates so many churches today? Today, Christ is treated not with reverence, but with flippant familiarity. It is true that Jesus is a friend to sinners because of his saving mercy. But Christians must also realize that, that, that Jesus is... Uh, but we must also realize that we come to a holy God in the person of Jesus Christ. Therefore, as pro the prophets Isaiah and Daniel show, together with the apostles Peter and John, true spirituality does not consist in joviality and lighthearted fun, much less in worldly enthusiasm. It is built on the foundation of an awe of a holy God, a loathing for sin, and a longing for the saving grace from the merciful hand of our Savior and Lord Jesus. The first matter of true godliness con concerns the necessity of dealing with our sin. In this way, when John, in conviction, it fell as though dead, Revelation 1.17 says, he reminds us of Romans 6.23, that the wages of sin is death. As sinners before the Lord, John there fell as one who had died in terror of the holy God. But church growth consultants today would criticize such an emphasis on the holiness of God as hindering our success in ministry. After all, we saw Peter's exclamation, De declare, depart from me, O Lord. It's the opposite of what church marketers are hoping to hear from visitors of their churches. John's experience, together with the testimony of the whole Bible, shows how the dread of sinners before the holiness of God is precisely what fosters a true and a saving relationship with the Christ of the Bible. According to the Bible, the spirit that has been crushed before God in humble repentance is a kind of spirit that God chooses to dwell in. In fact, the, the, our text in, in Isaiah 57, 15 says, For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, and who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy places, and also with him who is of contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly, and to revive the heart of the contrite. And with this in mind, the most important statement about John was not what he did falling down as though dead, but where he did it, at Jesus' feet, Revelation 1.17 says. Instead of turning away from God in terror and ungodly fear that, that loves God, he turned to the Lord in reverent humility. In the fear of the Lord and at the feet of Jesus is always the safest and the most blessed place in all of, uh, all of earth and all of history and all the world. You see, the reason why we are safest when we're trembling before the feet of, at the feet of Jesus is found in Christ's character as a tender Savior. Jesus showed this in two actions. First, John stated, He laid his right hand on me, Revelation 1.17 says. This is an act of great symbolic and personal significance. All through the Gospels, when Jesus healed or raised the dead, he, he touched the suffering object. Whether it was an unclean leper, a dead son, or a shame sinner, Jesus not only spoke words of power, he also placed his hand on the person of need. In this way, Jesus showed his compassion, above all, his personal acceptance. Being perfectly holy, Jesus can touch the unclean without becoming polluted himself. Being filled with mercy, he is willing to reach out with saving grace in a personal way. If you come to Jesus as a sinner and receive the gift of saving faith, that work through the, through the Holy Spirit was like the touching of his hand, 
Christ personally laid hold of you in mercy and power and love. And now imagine with me what that meant to John, completely undone at the vision of Christ's holy majesty, fallen as the one dead before the Lord, to have Jesus reach down with a strong hand of blessing to touch him and to lay hold of him for salvation. Second, having, having laid his right hand on John, the hand of strength and, and favor, Jesus spoke, fear not, Revelation 1.17 says. Now, these words may seem strange to us. We, we noted how right it was for John to fear, but when combined in salvation, the sinner's fear and the Savior's fear not go together. Derek Thomas explains how fear and fear not define the Christian experience when he says this. We fall down before his exalted majesty, and we feel the reassurance of his hand upon his, our shoulder, encouraging us to not be afraid. We are awed by his majesty and drawn by his grace. There is no other saving Christianity than that which joins the sinner's fear of holiness with the Savior's assurance of grace. And Jesus went on to explain his authority to banish our fear in Revelation 1, 17 through 18, which says, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. This statement connects back to the words of God the Father recorded in Revelation 1, 8. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And by taking up similar words, Jesus declares the oneness with the Father and deity. As the first and the last, Jesus is sovereign over all that comes between, that is, over all time, history, and even creation itself. As the living one, Jesus possesses power and life needed to, needed to cast away all fear. And sinners will therefore find in Jesus' person all that we need for salvation. In fact, this makes the essential point that Christianity is all about Christ, all about the past, the future, and the present. And sometimes people walk away from Christianity claiming that it no longer meets their needs. Perhaps it's a college student who was led away by sinful pleasure or even vain philosophy. Perhaps it's a man or a woman caught up in their work. In every case, they had forgotten if they ever knew the majesty and the glory and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's nowhere else for us to go in order to receive life. It's true that a Christianity without the living Christ is worth little. And so how many Christians experience this when their religion ceases to be about Jesus and his saving grace? Jesus is a living Lord and Savior, and it is always before him that we experience power, vitality, and joy that we ought to crave and that we truly, genuinely need. See, as Jesus describes himself, we, we see particular aspects of his all-sufficiency. There's never a time when Jesus as the eternal God is not present with us to lift us up, to forgive us our sins, to defeat our foes. Nothing can befall us that is contrary to his revealed will as the sovereign Lord. Even if the things we, we most fear should happen, we can know that Jesus has sovereignly willed them in order to strengthen our faith, to preserve us from our sin, and to lead us closer in fellowship with himself. Wherever Christ in his might is able to remove our trials at the time that he knows is good for his people. This is true in John's day under the, under the Roman emperor's persecution. The trials of the seven churches could only go as far as Christ willed them to go and always to serve the purposes of God. And the same is true for us. As the first and the last, our Savior not only chose us in eternity past, he not only called us into personal saving faith, he has promised our final salvation. He will also rule all things for our eternal well-being and his own eternal glory. Especially as a living one, Jesus is qualified to remove the fears of one like John, who is as dead before him. Ephesians 2.1 tells us that we're dead in our trespasses and sins, unable to believe the gospel or live according to God's word apart from him. But just as Jesus produces the, and possesses the purity that enables him to touch and to conquer the unclean, so also does Jesus possess in himself the life that removes the curse of death. This power comes to Christians today through the word of God, where the Lord speaks with the saving power of life. And so to receive the life we need, we must come to him. To dwell in the power of life, we must abide in the word. As Peter once cried out in John 6, 68, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Jesus' final statement in, in casting out John's fear directs us not only to his person, it also directs us to his victorious work. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death in Hades, Revelation 1.18 says. 
You see, coming to the person of Christ in faith, we meet the one who has the power to banish our fear. And then in trusting the work of Christ, we see that everything we fear has been conquered. So we are free to rejoice in the holy presence of our Savior and Lord. First, Jesus said, I die. In this way, conquering our fear of condemnation. And we have seen that when biblical figures fall in, in fear before Christ's majesty, it is largely as they are made aware of their sin and the, and the dread of wrath. How can the sinner content uh, with, with confront the holy God without the terror of condemnation? Jesus answers with reference to his atoning death on the cross, I died. You see, there are two great marvels in the world, and they're found together in this passage. The first marvel, the one that caused the angels to gaze downward, 1 Peter 1.12 says, is that sinners should be received into the loving favor of the holy God. Lawbreakers embraced by the righteous judge. How can it be? Well, the answer is given in the second marvel. Jesus, the living one, proclaims, I died. It was to perform the second wonder, so necessary if the first wonder could ever take place, that Jesus was born of a virgin. He became incarnate in true humanity. God the Son, the eternal, the sovereign, the self-existing in life, became man in order to die for the sins of his people. Matthew 1.21 says, You shall call his name Jesus. The angel told Joseph about the Son to be born, for he will save his people from their sins. And so the incarnation thus found fulfillment in the atonement. The purpose of Christmas was fulfilled on Good Friday. The power of Christ's death to cast out the fear of condemnation for sin is illustrated by another curious episode from Martin Luther's life. After his famous stand on God's word at the Council of Worms, Luther was whisked away for protection at a castle known as Wartburg. And there, while, while Luther was working on his translation of the Bible into German, Satan appeared to him to accuse Luther of his sins. In a letter written to his friend Philip Mel Mel Melanchon in, uh, on May 24, 1521, Luther recalled his anguish as Satan unveiled a long scroll with all of his sins written with care. Each of them read out loud one by one. All the while, Satan mocked his pathetic desire to serve God, assuring him that after all, he would end up in hell. Luther writhed in spiritual agony until at last he jumped up and cried, It is true, Satan, and many more sins which I have committed in my life, which are known to God only, but write this at the bottom of your list. And then Luther recited to the devil the glorious words of 1 John 1, 7, The blood of Jesus God's Son cleanses us from all sin. And then grasping an equal from his table, Luther threw it at the devil, who thus fled, leaving a black spot that can be seen there today, bearing testimony to Luther's deliverance from condemnation because Jesus had died for his sins. Not only did Jesus die to free us from the fear of condemnation, he also rose from the dead to overcome our fear and defeat. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore, Revelation 1.18 says. Many Christians, knowing that their sins are forgiven, yet live in the terror of sin's power because of their weakness in the face of temptation. And yet the Savior who rose from the dead has that same resurrection power to give to his people. In fact, in Ephesians 1, 17 through 20, Paul prayed that his readers would, would know what is uh, the immeasurable greatness of God's power towards us who believe. According to Paul, weak and needy Christians receive the same might that God worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Do you know the power that raised Jesus from the grave enables you now to continue in faith, to turn away from your sin, and offer your life in worship and service to the God of grace? Christians will not ultimately fail, and we are delivered from the fear of defeat by remembering Christ who died, is alive forevermore by the power of life that he gives to those who call on his name in times of need. And when we think of John falling as dead before the glory of, of, of Christ, Christians have a special reason to not only rely on the resurrection, but also look forward to our own resurrection. In our current sinful state, it's not possible for even the best of Christ's disciple to see his true majesty without being undone by his holiness. But just as John wrote in his, his first epistle in 1 John 3, 2, we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. In our resurrection, the children of God will be transformed into the likeness of the glory of Christ. All vestiges of sin having been removed, so we too are pure and radiant in holiness. Philip Hughes writes that because of our coming resurrection in Christ, the expectation of every Christian believer is that he shall see God. 
when his own glorification has become a reality, which will be the completion of his sanctification. John has said that knowing this should animate our hearts with the desire to increase in holiness now. Everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure, 1 John 3.3 3 says. Third, John delivers us from the final and the most dreadful of our enemies, the fear of death. And he thus concludes, And I have the keys of death in Hades, Revelation 1.18 says. To possess keys is to control the doors and have authority over, over who goes in and who goes out. You see, Jesus, by the conquest of his death and his resurrection, he rules as victor over both death and hell. Here, then, is how Christians are freed from our greatest fear. Christ, by his death, has removed our legal curse that requires death. And by his resurrection, has broken even the power of death itself. Christians, therefore, may live courageously before the threat of the grave. Paul Beasley Murray writes, He is able to lead his followers out from death into life. For those facing the prospect of martyrdom, it must now be seen as a great comfort to know that death was not the end. Because of this, they, they could give themselves to his service, whatever the risks, knowing their ultimate future was secure. A.W. Pitzer writes, The Christian need not fear to die. There is one who is his friend, who has overcome death, and who holds the keys of the grave and the unseen world, and who says to him, Fear not. And when we consider the careful message of Revelation 1, we see that the keys to understanding this book are, is not found in unraveling how the prophecies relate to the present or the current or, or even the future. More important than giving us clues to future history, Revelation directs our attention to the one who is sovereign over all history, the sovereign who stands in glory among the lampstands, and the Savior whose right hand lifts up his people and declares, Fear not. As the key to the book of Revelation, the first chapter fixes our eyes on Jesus in glory. The one who says, I am, Revelation 1.17 says. Our success as Christian comes not by unraveling every mystery of history, but in knowing who Jesus is, entering into disciples with him, discipleship with him through a living faith, relying on his all-sufficient saving work to comfort every foe that besets us. He is the one who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, Revelation 1.5 says. He is a glorious son of man who stands in power in his lampstand, Revelation 1.13 says. He is coming again with the clouds and every eye will see the one whom they pierce, Revelation 1.7 says. Do you know Jesus? Our calling is to receive him as Lord and Savior in faith, to serve his kingdom despite all tribulation, and to trust him to meet all of our needs. You see, knowing that he will not fail in any aspect of our salvation. And he says this in Revelation 1.17, Fear not I and the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am forevermore. And I have the keys of death in Hades. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Maybe today you are struggling with fear. You see, what, what Paul says in, in 2 Timothy chapter 1 is that we have not been given a spirit of fear, but of sound mind and self-control. Jesus says, look, I am. I've got this, guys. I, I am the I am God. Exodus 3.15 says, I am who I am. As seven times John says in his gospel, or Jesus says, excuse me, seven times in his gospel, I am. Last, last week, I, I talked about two of those. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and I am the light of the world. And as the good shepherd, guess what? He cares for his sheep. He, he says he goes after the one lost sheep. He leaves the 99, and he goes after the one lost sheep. But not only is Jesus the good shepherd, not only is he the light of the world, he is so much more. He is the true vine. In fact, Jesus says that in John 15. I am the vine and we are his branches. You see, this I am God, he's united us to, <coughs> he's united us to himself by faith. And what does marriage signify? It signifies that union. That's what Paul's talking about in Ephesians chapter 5. We've been, we've been wedded to Christ and Christ to us. In other words, the point is, we are Christ and he, he is ours. He is ours and we are his. That, that means that we can love him. We've been united to him. We've been joined to him for the purpose of communion with him. This I am God says, fear not. Jesus is not dead and gone. In fact, he says, but 
in verse 18, behold, I am alive forevermore. Jesus isn't dead and gone. He isn't dead and gone. He, he is victorious. He is victorious. I died. I am alive forevermore. Jesus didn't die. Jesus didn't die. He, I mean, he literally did die and, you know, on the cross in our place and for our sin. But death was not able to hold him down. He tells us why. He has the keys of death in Hades. Death itself is no match for Jesus. He holds the keys. He has the power and authority over them. That's the power of our, of our Jesus. That's the, the power of his sufficiency. And John is writing these things. These things, he says in verse 19, write therefore these things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. You see, as I saw last week, as verse 20 says, this, the seven stars that you saw in my right hand are, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars that are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands that are the, the seven churches, Christ is the head over the church. And not only the head over all the church, but the, the head of the cosmos. Head over the cosmos. He is the creator. He's the Lord. He owns us by virtue of being creator, by giving us life and breath and sustaining the world that he created, and by virtue of being Lord over our salvation and over the church. And he died. He died and he says, fear not. I am the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. See, such a confidence it should pierce our hearts. We, we, have, we think so many reasons to be afraid. We, we're afraid of what might happen tomorrow. We're afraid of what even might happen in this because of this virus. We might be afraid to go outside. But guess what? Jesus has that too. He's the one who is the first and the last, meaning that everything in between is under his control. There is not one point, one speck of all of our lives and all of history for the first and the last means, guess what? <laughs> uh, this is the beginning and this is the end. The first and the last. He is the alpha and the omega. There is no end with him. He, he is everything. That's what he means. And he's the living one. He's, he's not dead and gone. I, I died. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Well, we know that Jesus literally died on the cross. He died as that, that great substitute the this, this suffering servant of Isaiah 53 in our place and for our sin, as Romans 5, 1 through 5 tells us. But these are, this is great news. He's died, but, but he's alive forevermore. That means that he has power and authority over death itself. Death cannot hold him down, and that's why he has authority, the keys over death in Hades. And that's why we don't need to fear. He is the one who controls all time, all of history, because it all revolves around him. And therefore today, I just want to say what, what Hebrews 13 verse 8 says, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Maybe you're afraid, maybe, maybe fear has gripped your soul in this season of life, and you're afraid of what might happen to your job, what might happen to um, your family members. And you know what, I certainly, I certainly join you in, in being concerned about your family members and being concerned about where our world is headed. But I'm not afraid about what is going to happen in the future. We, we see here why. <laughs> Jesus is I am. He is before all time. He exists outside of time. He, he, he defines time. I am the first and the last. He's the living one. He's died. He, behold, he's alive forevermore. And he has power and authority over death itself. You know, this is amazing. If we get this, guess what? We will have peace, experiential peace. The knowledge that, that, that Paul talks about in Philippians 4, 6 through 8, that peace that, that Jesus said, hey, look, I, in John 14, I go before you to prepare a place for you. Guess what? This kind of confidence in the sovereignty of God is the kind of peace that Jesus wants us to have, to fear not. Because he knows that we do. We fear, we, we fret, we worry. And, and yet this is the one who knows the very hairs on our head. He, know, he searches our hearts. 
He knows our minds. He knows our thoughts before we even have a thought, the Bible tells us. And that's good news. That means that, that the one who searches our thoughts, the one who knows them, the one who searches our hearts and knows that, the one who knows every hair on our head, we can trust him. We need not fear. Fear not, Jesus says. He has all of time, all of history is moving towards its rightful end when Christ will come and Christ will conquer and Christ will establish his kingdom. All that shall lead to the praise and the worship of the people of God and to greater confidence in God who says, fear not, I am. So I ask you today as we wrap up this study, do you believe that? And, and I mean when I say, do you believe that? I'm not just saying, do you believe the right theological words? I'm saying, in practice, do you believe this? Do you trust God to fear not? Because I am. Do you believe truly that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore? Well, Second uh, Second Corinthians one twenty tells us that the promises of God are are fulfilled in Christ. You see, the I am has fulfilled his promises. And they, Paul says, are yes and amen in Christ alone. That's good news. It means that you can trust him who says fear not because he has completed his work and his promises are true because they're tied to his character. See this, I am God. He's come, he's bled, he's died in our place. And even now, he is our high priest and our intercessor. And so we can trust him. We can hold on to him. We can cling to him, not just with mere words, pie in the sky, prayers, and the right theological words, but with our hearts, cling to him. Fear not. Hold fast. As Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, trust in the Lord with your whole heart. Lean not on your own wisdom, but on your ways acknowledge him. That's what we're talking about. Are you acknowledging him in all your ways? Trusting in the and the one who, who is the first and the last, the living one, the one who's died, the one who's alive forevermore, the one who has the keys of death in Hades. That's who we're talking about. Trust him. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own wisdom and knowledge and understanding. Trust the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can trust you and that because you're a good God, you're holy and majestic in splendor and radiance. So we confess we often don't trust you. We are often so full of fear and anxiety and worry and, and unbelief. Lord, help us to fear not. We thank you that you come alongside of us with the Spirit. You comfort us. You assure us that you are with us. You walk alongside of us and before us. You've given us your word, your promises and you've fulfilled them all. Every one of your word will stand, your word will remain, and you use your word and with power in our lives. So Lord, may our lips, may our hearts be filled with the praise of God today. And may we worship you, not just with our lips, but from our hearts testifying of your goodness, of your love and the glory of God, and the promises that are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. In your precious name I pray, amen. Thank you for listening to the Servants of Grace podcast today. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, leave a rating on the app, and share our episode with your friends and family. If you'd like to, you can follow us on Instagram at Servants of Grace, on Twitter at Servants of Grace, or by searching Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this podcast on the front page of our website at servantsofgrace.org. 